So welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar, which is Smart Nanotox, Advancing Commercial Development of Safe Nanomaterials. Um, I am going to hand you over to your host for most of this afternoon, who is Vladimir, and he will give you the opening presentation with three further presentations around the main outcomes from the Smart Nanotox project and how they can be directly relevant to you. We have a few polls to share with you also today. So at the end of Vladimir's presentation, we will kickstart the first poll to find out a little bit more about you and where you come from. So I will hand over to Vladimir now and look forward to a very interesting uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. So we uh, today are going to talk about our project Smart Nanotox. I'm Vladimir Labaskin. I'm a professor at the UCD uh, University College Dublin, and I'm the project coordinator. Next slide, please. Today is actually the officially the last day of the project after the uh, COVID related extension. And we were uh, running the project for 55 months now, and it was funded within the uh, Horizon 2020 call for increasing the capacity to perform nano-safety assessment. So, uh, University College Dublin is coordinating this and the project team includes 12 partners from academia, government uh, institutes, and uh, industry. Next slide. The central idea of the project uh, was uh, to look into mechanistic uh, understanding of the toxicity. We were thinking how we can, in principle, improve the rate at which the toxicity assessment is performed, uh, for which uh, we decided that we need to understand what is actually going on after the nanomaterial uh, gets into the body and uh, starts interacting with the molecules, uh, cells, and, and tissues. So for that, we decided that we need to understand all the steps uh, that are going between the initial contact and uh, to the development of the uh, adverse outcome. In this way, we uh, can hope to be able to relate nanomaterial properties to the specific events that will follow uh, the contact. Next slide. So the uh, mechanistic approach to toxicity assessment is based on the idea of adverse outcome pathway. So this language is now accepted by OECD and OECD working group is pushing this forward and we are actively participating in this. What, what is adverse outcome pathway? So you see the uh, number of events starting uh, from the left-hand side uh, from nanomaterial properties and initial interactions of nanomaterial with the molecules just at the surface, for example, of our lung alveolar membrane, then propagating through these interactions into the cells and causing some cell responses then cell responses causing the changes at the uh, level of the organ and then entire organism and on po population. So if we are able to uh, recover the entire causal chain of events leading from initial contact, from a initiating event to the adverse outcome, then we should be able to understand what kind of properties, what kind of interactions are controlling and triggering uh, this pathway. So next slide, please. If we simplify the picture to, to realize such a program, to be, uh, make predictions for new nanomaterials even before they uh, uh, go in production, uh, predictions in terms of their potential toxicity, so we need to be uh, mechanistic at both ends of this uh, simplified diagram. On the right-hand side, it's a biological mechanistic picture uh, with all the biological events uh, leading from the initial interaction to the adverse outcome. And on the left-hand side, we have nanomaterial properties and molecular interactions at bi nano interface that trigger uh, those events, initiating events of the pathway, so key events. So therefore, we've, we're focusing on both sides of this diagram, but our predict predictive part will be uh, in the box uh, just above the uh, arrow on the left, modeling and in vitro experiments that we uh, aim to design to predict the initiating and key events. So our program, therefore, in the mechanistic assessment paradigm is such that we are not trying to predict adverse outcomes as such. We're not trying to 
predict uh, whether material can cause fibrosis just by looking at the material boss, we are trying to predict whether the material can cause the events that finally can lead to fibrosis. And in, in this paradigm, we believe that we can understand everything. Yes, please, next one. So therefore, uh, our team is made in such a way that we cover all the uh, stages of this process. So we have in vitro experiments, we have in vivo experiments, in vivo exposure, and we have in, in silico modeling uh, to understand the interactions of the bio nano interface. After we collect all these types of data, so we have a lot of in vivo, in vitro, and in silico data, then we perform uh, analysis, and analysis is done at several levels. So we use systems biology, and we use uh, then statistical analysis and analysis of molecular interactions to recover the entire chain of events. And therefore, our outcomes are multifold. First of all, we uh, obtain the data of, on the interactions at the bio nano interface. It's a lower level, our results. Then we obtain information about the key events and initiating events that can lead to adverse outcomes. Then we recover information about toxicity pathways and adverse outcome pathways. All of this information is reported at different levels. And today we will show you what in particular we are doing. In addition to that, wherever we feel that we don't have an appropriate method, we are looking into methods and method improvement um, for, for, uh, that will uh, enable us to obtain a certain type of data. So some of uh, these data have never been obtained before, so we had to develop new methods. Next slide, please. So in the next couple of slides, I um, will show you the, the basically the gallery of our methods. So we have multi-scale molecular simulations, where we start with the really atomistic structure of the materials and molecular interactions at the atomistic level and predict using that, predict the interactions at the bio nano interface, how proteins and, and lipids are binding to a specific nanomaterial and what it can trigger. So we have in vivo exposure. Uh, some of the uh, exposure techniques are unique and uh, a lot of data are obtained in that way. Then we have in vitro exposure. And here we are using a submerged and air liquid interface systems, and some of them uh, we'll be talking about uh, later, are designed specifically to collect the data we need to recover the mechanistic picture. Next slide. In addition to the data collection methods, we have this analysis method where we can uh, tr try to understand, figure out what uh, is actually happening after the initial contact. For that, we analyze the omics, transcriptomics uh, specifically, proteomics and lipidomics uh, to understand the molecular interactions, recover gene regulation networks, but also we can track particles inside the tissues and advanced labeling techniques were developed to uh, enable us to track nanoparticles after the initial contact to see where they go and what they actually do to the lung tissues. So our main focus one was on respiratory you know, toxicity. So what I'm talking about is mostly inhalation, uh, exposure, and, and uh, corresponding uh, adverse outcomes. Next slide. So in this big picture, uh, you see actually how we specify that approach. So we've identified, uh, when we looked at into uh, um, respiratory exposure, we identified five adverse outcomes that we uh, would try to predict using initial interactions. This acute lung injury, chronic inflammation, cardiovascular effects, pulmonary fibrosis, and lung cancer, and identified a set of uh, initiating and key events that can trigger uh, those pathways, specific pathways. And then we, we design, if you click on that, uh, Claire, and next one. Yeah, so we design smart tests uh, aiming to predict those initiating and key events for this specific adverse outcomes. Next slide. What kind of data and uh, outcomes uh, follow from our activities? First of all, we develop new concepts. As I said, mechanism-based toxicity assessment paradigm includes those uh, strategy 
and uh, lists of the data that need to be collected to understand the, the full mechanic, mechanistic picture of the uh, development of adverse outcome. We developed a number of methods for non-material labeling, tracking, post-uptake characterization. We developed methods for realistic air liquid interface exposure imitation, making I results and, and exposure quantification. We developed methods for binary interaction modelings, and we developed methods to analyze uh, proteome, analyze uh, pathway, and, and analyze omic data. We developed a number of models, predictive models in silico, uh, QSARs for predicting molecular, uh, molecular initiating events and key events, protein adsorption and corona models that we discussed in the later presentations. We collected a lot of data in vivo, in vitro, and in silico, and some of these data are, data are already posted, so some of them reported through OECD uh, reports, and some of them are uh, taken on by, by next Horizon 2020 projects like uh, Patrols, Nanosolvit, and Nanocommons. You can get access to the tools, protocols, and data through these uh, institutions. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, toxicology, we have described five uh, respiratory adverse outcome pathways that they included in AOP wiki. Gene expression profiles uh, collected in in vivo and in vitro have been reported to geo uh, database. Novel uh, air liquid interface systems to imitate the exposure conditions are uh, delivered through vitro cell. So uh, Tobias's presentation will, will be next. New analysis protocols and, and uh, computational models are included in NanoCommons knowledge base, and it's free to use for the community. And uh, further information can be obtained through the Smart NanoTox website. So next slide, please. In terms of uh, nanoparticles, we've developed novel uh, nanomaterial labeling techniques, protocols for corona analysis, algorithms for image analysis and colocalization, like post-uptake characterization. We developed ideas of protein corona-based fingerprints. So based on the protein corona of the nanoparticles, we can predict the, the activity. Nanomaterials tracking techniques. We developed a lot of computational uh, tools and, and uh, force fields, uh, multi-scale for predicting corona and uh, nanoparticle activity, and collected uh, descriptors for over 60 materials. Next slide. And uh, then for industry and regulation, we've developed uh, identify novel toxicity endpoints that we uh, consider to be more uh, accurate and more economic to predict in vivo AAPs uh, as a replacement for in vivo exposure experiments, novel in vitro assays, novel toxicity mechanisms reported in our publications and basis for grouping and read across. And, and most importantly, uh, if we know the uh, properties of concern, then we can uh, predict uh, that for materials that hasn't been produced yet. Next slide. And, and finally, so we, we can also share the data from the project. One of the uh, biggest outcomes is the huge amount of data we've generated. So we are now compiling a database on that where you, you can find the data on in vivo exposure. Next slide data obtained from in vitro experiments, post-uptake characterization and tracking, uh, omics, uh, high resolution imaging and uh, liquid interface exposure. And next slide, or in silico. So we've uh, calculated various interactions between uh, biomolecules and specific nanomaterials for over 60 materials, including oxides, uh, carbon-based uh, materials, and, and some other like silica, most common industrial uh, nanomaterials. And I hope you'll get more details in the following three presentations where uh, the specific outcomes will be presented to you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Vladimir. We're going to see if we can do launch our first poll now. So I am going to switch this on and hopefully everybody can see it on their screens and select something. This is just a little bit to find out more about you guys and where you come from. So if you can see the poll on your screen, we would invite you to select where you are from. And we'll just give it 30 seconds for everybody to uh, fill it in.
So that's great. Nearly everybody has done now. I have resisted the temptation to commentate it like a horse race, as some wings are faster to grow than others. So we have most of the answers in now. So I will end the polling and hopefully it will give you the result. OK, I will share the results. So these are you can see most of us in the room today are from research backgrounds, but we do have a few industrial um, participants, which is excellent, and also public body um, organisations as well. And I'd say thanks very much because this this helps us to understand who is coming in to find out more information, and it will certainly help us later in the webinar when we ask you a little bit more about um, ask you a little bit more about what you want to see next. So I'm now going to, I think, stop the polling, which you should now not see that. Uh, and then we will go on to our next presentation, who will be Tobias from Vitracell. So hopefully that is on your screens now okay. And if you want to introduce yourself, Tobias, uh, and we look forward to your presentation. Yes, thank you, Claire. My name is Tobias Krebs. I'm the Managing Director from Vitrocell. And today I'm going to talk about the smart in vitro exposure systems for the exposure of lung cells at the air liquid interface, which were developed and evaluated under smart nanotox. So next slide, please. So uh, the applications of the devices uh, we, uh, we have uh, developed are not only for airborne particles and nanoparticles, but can be used also for virus research, inhaled drugs and chemicals. And the objective is to uh, test those substances in vitro on uh, cells from the respiratory tract. Next, next slide, please. So just a recap on the liquid interface exposure. So as you see in the left picture, the great advantage is that all components of the test material can reach the cells directly as they are not covered with uh, cell culture media. So the aerosol maintains the reactivity of the original compounds. It is therefore a physiologically relevant exposure. And uh, what is very important, you have the possibility to integrate online dosimetry tools. So the air liquid interface gives you a defined dose as often opposed to the submerged exposure, which you see on the right, where you might have effects of upward diffusion of the particles or different sedimentation times. So uh, overall, the air liquid interface is uh, a more uh, yeah, defined dose giving procedure. Next slide, please. So uh, under the scope of the Smart Nanotox project, we uh, developed and characterized six different technologies, all related to liquid aerosols and dry powders, not to gases and complex mixtures at this, as this is outside of the field of the project. So I'm going to explain now all the six uh, technologies. Next slide, please. So the first device uh, uh, is the cloud system. You see in the upper left, the uh, cloud system at the start of the project. And over the course of the project, we have uh, developed this further as a new development with a touchscreen op operation. It has a recipe and nebulizer database. It's a uh, automated, fairly automated process now. The big advantage of this device is that you don't need an external airflow. It's a simple operation. You have a small nebulization volume of 200 microliter of your suspension. It's easy to use. And uh, the new uh, cloud alpha, as we call it, uh, maintains all properties which has the uh, former cloud system. So here you see uh, how it works. So you pipette into a nebulizer 200 microliter of your suspension. The nebulizer forms a mist and then via single droplet sedimentation, the particles are deposited in approximately five to six minutes on the cell cultures. Next slide, please. Uh, very important is that uh, you can use the system with different insert sizes. They have, though, 
uh, a different variability of uh, insert to insert, outside deposition. So the six well is at about 3%, the 12 well is at approximately 8%, and the 24 well is at 10% variation. Uh, but, uh, well, this is due to the size of the inserts mostly. And also you must know that this is uh, still a very good value for an in vitro exposure system. Next slide, please. Then there was the task uh, how we can work whenever we have scarce materials or very expensive materials. We uh, then looked for a method to uh, minimize the nebulization volume. And this is uh, realized in the cloud max. Here you have a nebulization volume of 10 to 40 microliter with a high deposition efficiency. And you use three nebulizers in parallel so that you can use then three other positions to prepare your cell cultures. So this uh, is shown in the next slide, how this sums up in comparison with the Cloud6. So the Cloud6 has a nebulization volume of 200 microliter, the Cloud Max of 30, uh, whereas the Cloud Max give you, gives you an insert uh, culture deposition efficiency of 35%, which is really a very high figure compared to the Cloud Alpha of 14% for all six inserts. So uh, still, this is also for an in vitro system a good figure, but it can be improved through the Cloud Max. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of dosimetry, uh, there was an extensive, uh, extensive evaluation of the microbalance, which can uh, be inserted in the module and gives you the deposition in nanogram per square centimeter. You see it on the upper left picture, how it is integrated in the module. So you nebulize uh, and then, in the, uh, then you have a plateau. Uh, when the nebulization stops, then you have a drying phase with the plateau again. And then after the drying phase, when you lift the uh, compartment, uh, uh, you have another removal of humidity and this gives you your final dose. And in the right graph, you see uh, the detection limit of the microbalance, which is for the six well, 170 70 nanogram. And here you see then results of different materials and their uh, cell culture relevant deposition, uh, uh, so to speak, the onset dose. And here you see that all doses are above the detection limit. So this shows that the microbalance really is a useful tool to detect your relevant dose. This has been also now extensively uh, uh, reported in a recent publication, which you see in the lower left. Next slide, please. Then we looked further into, into the cloud uh, technology, and we uh, developed a design probe to measure humidity first. So we had various nebulization volumes applied to the cloud, and uh, the comparison of the different volumes shows that the, really the 200 microliter give you uh, a um, above 90% humidity. And if you double that, it, it's only marginal higher, but more closer to a complete saturation, which would, in a, in a, yeah, would uh, also bear the risk that you have uh, uh, droplets on the walls. So, this shows really that those shortly above 90% uh, with the 200 microliter are uh, a very good figure to uh, achieve the effects of the cloud. Next slide, please. Then we uh, also measured the uh, particle concentration uh, with the same probe. And uh, you could see that you have initially a very high particle concentration, then it drops to a plateau where actually you are measuring only the humidity. And if you want to get rid of this humidity, you can vent the cloud in a bed with a special venting system and remove that up to zero. Alternatively, of course, you can open the cloud, but for hazardous materials, the venting, of course, is uh, yeah, a nice add-on feature. Next slide, please. Now we go into the area of the dry powders. For, for materials which you do not want to suspend. So here we evaluated the powder atomizer together with the powder chamber. And uh, this is for relatively small 
uh, 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 numbers of materials, so 100 milligram per uh, shot. So next slide, please. So you basically have a uh, pneumatic controls unit. You have a powder reservoir with a jet nozzle. And uh, here you go with a 16 bar into a uh, multi-stage chamber, which is pre-pressurized by eight bar. So you really form a nice uh, uh, cloud of particles in that chamber. And uh, you have the advantage that you deagglomerate de the, the powder in this way. So next slide, please. So the performance characterization is uh, shown on the left, measured at different times after the first uh, shot. So uh, it indeed shows that you can generate with this powder atomizer a nice nano aerosol. Still, you have some agglomerates uh, from the material which originally had 25 nanometer, but still I think it's a very nice nano aerosol as shown here. And this we guided with special probes into a, a powder chamber with a special valve and tubing system and sampled then into four columns of the powder chamber. So next slide please. And uh, depending on uh, the exposure conditions, we have here also a thermoporesis option where you can increase the uh, speed of uh, deposition. You reach with this device now uh, a, a deposition range of 400 to 1,600 nanogram per square centimeter in, uh, in one uh, experiment. So uh, those figures are compared to the other methods, relatively low, but you must be in mind that you are dealing here really with small particles. Next slide, please. Then uh, there is uh, another uh, possibility to evaluate dry powders, and that is the vial injector. So the vial injector is a system uh, when you want to expose particles really with a high deposition efficiency and if you want to really achieve a high mass on your cell, uh, on your cell cultures. And uh, this is explained in the next slide, please. So basically what you have here is a vial with a pressure gas, which is the R134A and a dosing valve. So we mix the particles with the R134A and uh, we then uh, have an automated release of the dosing valve, valve which then guides the uh, aerosol into the cell culture chamber, which you see below in the drawing. So uh, here we have uh, an invested material of up to 60 microgram per milliliter in this mixture. And you can achieve doses of above 50 microgram per square centimeter with the system. So uh, this is a highly efficient uh, way to apply dry powders to your cell cultures. So next slide, please. Here you see an evaluation of the deposited mass via a microbalance in the vial injector. So actually you see here each step of each injection, which you can uh, then um, apply uh, uh, tenfold or twentyfold. Uh, you can also have a waiting time uh, between those different shots. So uh, this then can sum up to a maximum deposition of uh, above 550 microgram per square centimeter, whereas in the cloud we have 15 to 20 microgram per square centimeter. And as compared to the powder atomizer, the powder chamber, we have only 
1.6 microgram per square centimeter. So really those three methods now really give you room to look at the effects under different conditions, depositions, and uh, this then really depends also on your substance and on your goal, which uh, material you want to use. So next slide, please. In summary, uh, we can say that we successfully uh, developed and characterized new in vitro exposure equipment. And uh, for each of the devices, we have different technology readiness levels now. For the Cloud Alpha, Cloud Max, and uh, for the microbalance, as well as the humidity and photometer assessment, we have really the, achieved the highest level. So this is a commercial product, which is available for, uh, for uh, the users. Uh, it has also user manuals and it has uh, also uh, operation uh, hints and, uh, and uh, um, yeah, um, further information on, on the different essays we did. The powder atomizer and powder chamber and uh, the vial injector are at level 7, so there is still an optimi optimization to be done, but also those products are available for joint future customer projects. So, next slide, please. Yeah, this is a greeting from Waldke from our facility here in the Black Forest, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tobias, and for ending on a really nice place. I think uh, it looks sunny and it looks nice, so I think everybody will like that today. I would like to invite people to submit any questions that they have for Tobias right now otherwise we can go to the next presentation so please just use the uh, chat function on your zoom screen and while we're waiting for that i'll just prepare the next presentation Now, it doesn't seem that we have any questions just right now, but that's no problem. So we'll move straight on to uh, Mark from Desalt Systems. And if you can see the screen okay, please take it away, Mark. All right, yes, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, so my name is Mark Meunier. I work at uh, Tassel System, the BioVia brand. And today I will uh, present a work on prediction of nanomaterials toxicity from uh, intelligent quantitative structure activity relationship. Uh, I am based in Cambridge. It might not be as sunny as <laughs> where Tobias is, uh, we wish. Uh, next slide down, or can I do it myself? No, I can't. Okay, so uh, today uh, with a very brief introduction to the system, uh, I will go straight into the uh, main topic of uh, QSARs and then go on what is uh, exploitable in this part of the project for the smart nanotox uh, material. So the nanomaterials and the atomistic models that uh, we have uh, developed during the project, some uh, regression model, mathematical uh, regression models, or so-called QSAR, then uh, that have been built on experimental data generated by the uh, experimentalists uh, in vivo in vitro. And uh, using this, uh, packaging those QSARs, then uh, you would be able to uh, test your own compounds, your own chemistry, and also show how uh, we have integrated uh, other outcomes, such as the endotomic potentials and the um, modeling of the interactions, say from uh, biomaterials, membranes, lipids, and nanoparticles. Uh, next slide, please. So that's a system uh, is a, a large European software company, about over 20,000 employees worldwide now, headquartered in, uh, in south of Paris. Uh, we are known for developing uh, 3D design and CAD software, also a uh, digital mock-up or digital tween. It's a big uh, principle for us, a big, big thing, topic to work on. Uh, we're known for product life cycle management. And um, so there's 11 brands such uh, well known, such as Katia, Simulia, SolidWorks, and uh, the one I will present today is uh, BioVR. Uh, next one, please. 
So very important, as I mentioned for us, is to connect virtual and real. So connect a virtual experiment, uh, in silico prediction, as well as real experiments. So we offer a lot of uh, lab data management solutions, laboratory informatics, but also predictive science tools to uh, either using a QSR, either doing molecular uh, modeling, so molecular simulations, and that uh, in what is of concern today really about the deeper understanding of the material, the engineering nanomaterials. Right. So a deeper understanding of the say interaction between the nanoparticle and the lipid membrane to see how it would interact in the human bodies, predict uh, product performance uh, on the model, how they would behave, trying to replace or reduce uh, more physical testing and being able to anticipate uh, potentiality uh, here, toxicity. Next slide, please. So the uh, QSAR, the uh, IQSAR, or so-called uh, quantitative uh, nanostructure uh, toxicity relationship, uh, is really trying to find a, a, a link between the chemical and physical description of the engineered nanomaterials and its uh, toxicity. Right. So we start with a bioactive nanomaterial, such as uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, TiO2 nanoparticles, and so forth. We make a physical description, and we use so, so-called descriptors, which are really characteristics, if you wish, of the material, such as its density, such as uh, its shape, volume, uh, and so forth, some uh, experimental descriptions as well as in silico descriptions. So say it's a bond gap, uh, the, it could be the uh, hydration share energies and so forth. So once we have a complete list of uh, physical description of the ensemble of material, of, and, and as uh, Vladimir mentioned, we had a selected 60 in this particular project, uh, then uh, we use machine learning algorithm to uh, link those uh, nanomaterials descriptors to the toxicity reported, uh, measured by the experimentalist. Uh, next slide, please. So the uh, list of materials uh, that we had in this project and the 60, as I said, uh, is uh, chemically quite diverse, but uh, we had uh, carbon-based, uh, so, um, multi wall or single wall carbon nanotubes. It could be modified. Um, it could be the length would uh, also be uh, different. Uh, they could be functionalized. Uh, they could be grafting uh, of the various chemical functions on top. We also had an ensemble of uh, nanoparticles, uh, metal alloy uh, type nanoparticles, which also could be grafted or, or, or used as pristine of, of various diameters. And those materials came mostly from other uh, European projects, and the NanoRig 2, and uh, the complete list and description can, can be found on, on those uh, particular web pages. Next slide, please. So the real material uh, that uh, you are used of, uh, you produce, like a carbon nanotubes here, and nanoparticle, and, and so forth. Next slide, please. And the th then we, we use those uh, modeling and simulation tools, uh, such as the BioVR Material Studio package, to make molecular models, which is a, a space description uh, of the uh, real material. And because those are uh, nanomaterials, with, uh, for some, of a length scale exact to, to the uh, nanometers, uh, we, we can build entire nanoparticles and represent the exact materials. Also, sometimes those real material are a bit bigger and we have to, to use uh, slightly smaller models. And as you can see, it's, it can be, we, we can build very diverse uh, chemistry uh, from the uh, circular or ovoid shape nanoparticle with or without grafting. We can build those, uh, nanotubes, multi-wall nanotubes or graphene sheets. And next slide, please. And uh, as I said, uh, they are often chemically modified and they can be very diverse. You use this uh, chemistry to uh, enhance uh, dispersion uh, very often or, or improve mechanical properties and but, uh, or uh, thermal or mechanical behavior 
or so. So we we also can take into account and during the Nanotox project, we had developed script also to automatically distribute uh, randomly an ensemble of such chemical structure on the top of the material model. Next slide, please. So that's uh, an example of a, a carboxylic acid grafted uh, carbon nanotube single wall. Next slide, please. That uh, so now we uh, doing the, of course a few years of the project the experimentalists have uh, tested a lot of this uh, nanomaterial and and for the toxicity and you can see here an example of uh, toxicity or neutral bile cells measurement as a function of the nanomaterial and you see a, a large variations and so the the idea now is is for this uh, QSI is really to try to understand what uh, part, what chemistry uh, we observe here is is really responsible for the uh, value of the peak that we observe for the toxicity why do some behave uh, uh, with a very small response and others have a very high response so yeah next slide please So made available are uh, an ensemble also of tools. Huh? So the, I mentioned the BioVia Material Studio uh, software where you can have spreadsheet-like uh, data sheet like you, you see here. And you have an ensemble of chemical structures with all uh, the models, the um, molecular models that we built. And then all the physical characteristics as well as the experimental description of the materials. So that allow us to have uh, an ensemble if you wish uh, all together the data for the the chemistry and then all the descriptors the physical description the independent variables that we use in after in our statistical uh, modeling which is on the next uh, on, on the right here uh, a tool uh, from called pipeline pilot where we use the, um, the data science collection in order to make a uh, build uh, mathematical regression that we link the chemical structures to the toxicity reported. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, you, we, we use the uh, RP4S model. So that is a, a machine learning algorithm uh, that we, we thought was well suited uh, for purpose here. And um, yes, so those are very commonly available uh, type of uh, machine learning algorithm. Uh, important here is with uh, my RP4S regression here, which is um, now then made available to to the users. Uh, so in this uh, random forest uh, can be reused uh, directly. So the users would now plug its own chemistry or read a spreadsheet or database or the catalog or whatever and then apply this particular, uh, then would compute the descriptors, those physical, uh, or enter some physical descriptors, uh, some experimental data or some computed data, and then use that, that particular uh, regression model now in order to predict toxicity. Next slide, please. In, in the next slide, we show the, uh, the QSAR model itself. Huh? So that's the output of uh, one of the spreadsheets of the toxicity data. There's a two and a half or nearly two and a half thousand points that were used uh, to build and validate the QSAR. So on the left here, you see the, uh, the validation and the actual regression versus the predicted response. So we have a, a, a very good uh, R square. And and the standard deviation here, you make sure you have nothing uh, too too far away. If you have some point a bit too uh, away from the center here, then you you don't go back and look at what chemistry uh, can cause you trouble. But really, then uh, you have uh, a mathematical regression, mathematical equation that include all the important physical characteristics as well as some experimental one. So protocol, what I uh, talk uh, mentioned here, protocol setup. It's a sacrifice day or the dosage, of course, those are uh, very uh, relevant to the potency uh, of, of the material, but also uh, other things like uh, how many carbon atoms you have, what so the links, the chain links, of course, and, and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. 
So how this really can be uh, reused and the exploitation of those models. So if you're a non-expert, the idea would be to build a web port, a uh, web service where uh, the users can upload their own chemistry and then uh, on a simple interface, upload all the data and then ask for a test to be made, a virtual test, and use that very validated QSA model and to have an idea of the uh, propensity of that particular nanomaterials for toxicity. Uh, another way would be then similar, but to use a, a consultant, uh, experts, service providers, or uh, use a commercial package with a bit of training. Uh, tools like the Pipeline Pilot, Material Studio I mentioned, can be uh, quite easily accessed and used to uh, build your models and, and uh, use those regression models. If you're a QSA expert now, or toxicologist, or uh, work in uh, health and safety, uh, you might be interested also to use those QSA models uh, and, and then um, either run them as a consultant, as a service, or also to improve upon them or to make them more tailored to a particular type of chemistry you have. So if you only really concerned with metallic nanoparticles, uh, the data regarding carbonous material might not be of interest or might uh, also not be uh, as good as um, training materials for your particular data set. So in this case, uh, uh, the expert could also refine the chemistry uh, and, and improve and change slightly the equation and improve upon it for a particular family of chemistry. And uh, then also, as I said, uh, you could provide a toxicity assessment for non-experts as a consultant. And next slide, please. A second uh, outcome uh, is also to be the building of all those molecular uh, and, and coarse grain models can also uh, be made available to the users in order to reuse those uh, models into their simulations. Uh, Stockholm University, UCD, and uh, IC and Imperial College have developed also new interatomic potentials. That's a description between the different uh, nanomaterials or nanomaterials and uh, biomaterials. So that's also something that's been well uh, validated. There's quite a few publications can be found on this topic. And so those models and interatomic potentials can also be uh, reused. Next slide, please. And uh, I think Vladimir also mentioned in the nano commons, this uh, knowledge-based data repository centers uh, where we upload most of our um, experimental and in silico data. And also another tool that was developed was a nano uh, particle protein uh, corona tools and to measure the adsorption energies and rank the protein by their binding affinities. So uh, this also sort of little uh, molecular uh, tools that can be reused by the community. And next slide, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. And again, while I switch over slides to the next presenter, I just ask if anybody submit any questions they would like uh, using the chat function. Nope, that's no problem at all. So we come to our final presenter of the afternoon, which is Jurid, who I would really like to introduce here. So Jurid, your slides are ready and you can get started. Thank you. So my name is Jurid Sorli. I work at the National Research Center for the Work Environment, and this is located in Copenhagen in Denmark. I will talk about the, S and the uh, AOPs that have been developed in smart nanotox and in particular one uh, AOP linking lung surfactant function disruption in vitro to sudden adverse lung effects. Next please. So the target audience for the talk today is um, uh, mainly to help support the future of uh, regulatory frameworks for AOPs. So in this um, 
uh, review paper that has been uh, published by uh, authors also from Smart Nanotalks. We look at uh, how, what can be done uh, so that AOPs can be used for regulation. Uh, in the paper, there are nine central recommendations for promoting the development, use and acceptance of AOP as a framework for manufactured nanomaterial decision making. Uh, also, people that work with uh, lung toxicology should be interested in, uh, in this uh, talk. Next, please. So as Vladimir already said, the, um, one of the main contributions from Smart Nanotox were the AOPs that we developed. So all the AOPs are focused on inhaled materials and they have diverse endpoints such as fibrosis, lung cancer, cardiovascular disease and acute lung toxicity. The AOPs are uh, on the, can be found in the AOP wiki and uh, further description and discussions can also be found in this open access review that has been published recently. Next, please. Here is a, a figure from this publication. As you can see, the, I have highlighted in, in, um, to the right side the adverse outcomes that we predict with these AOPs. In, even if we have very different starting points, there are a lot of um, interaction between the AOPs and some uh, key events that can link to many different adverse outcomes. Next, please. So the one that I will talk a little bit more about today is acute toxicity. So the acute toxicity that we uh, discuss now is sudden adverse lung effects. So these are effects that start shortly after exposure. So they include uh, symptoms like coughing, tightness in the chest, difficulty breathing, and, uh, and these symptoms can lead from vomiting and uh, fever, so flu-like symptoms. The symptoms can either be resolved by themselves, but in some cases they can lead to more serious lung injury and lasting effects. Next, please. So the AOP is uh, the number 302, links the molecular initiating event, the substance uh, interaction with lung surfactant to the adverse outcome, sudden adverse lung effects. Next, please. And one of the um, outcomes of the smart nanotox was that we wanted to find uh, some smart assays that could uh, be used in key events of AOPs. So for this AOP, we are using the constrained drop surfactometer and it can measure the first key event in this AOP, the disruption of lung surfactant function. Next, please. So to understand the, the, the um, function of lung surfactant, we have to uh, go through some basics. So the, during the breathing cycle, the lung volume goes down. And what happens in the lungs is that as your surface area becomes smaller, this reduces the surface tension at the air-liquid interface. These uh, black pictures uh, represent what happens in the in vitro method. So a drop of lung surfactant is reduced in the same um, percentage as when you are breathing and also the surface tension goes down as uh, the area goes down. Next please. Then as you take a breath in your lung volume becomes larger and this also increases your surface area. Uh, and when this happens, your surface tension at the air-liquid interface goes up. Next, please. So in this uh, AOP, the first step, as I said already, is the substance-lung surfactant interaction. So any 
substance that you inhale into your lungs will come into contact with the lung surfactant. This is the first barrier that uh, is between air and the blood. Uh, the first initiate the first key event, the disruption of lung surfactant function. If this uh, happens, you can this can lead to the alveoli to collapse. And then if you take a deep breath in, this can reopen your alveoli. However, when you reopen the alveoli, this can cause shear stress on the cells that are the barrier between the lung, uh, the air and the blood and can cause small breaks in this barrier. And this can lead to bleeding into the lung. Here you have a backwards arrow in the AOP because components in the blood can further disrupt the lung surfactant function. Next please. Uh, you could also take a different pathway, so the alveoli that collapsed, you will may not be able to open them again, this results in a reduced lung volume and impaired oxygenation of the blood. So both of these um, effects will in combination lead to sudden adverse lung effects. Next, please. So this is uh, an example from what happens in the surfactometer. You have a, a drop of lung surfactant that you are making smaller and the surface tension goes down and then you as you make it larger again, the surface tension goes up. So this would be one breathing cycle. If you then start an aerosol exposure with a test substance, next please. Uh, the same drop as you reduce the surface area and increase the surface area, the surface tension does not go down. So if this is happening in your lungs, uh, you will feel uh, the symptoms. Next, please. So the normal alveoli are depicted here. If you have inhibited lung surfactant function, you get a high surface tension. Next, please. And this will cause the alveoli to collapse and you will start to cough and feel the tightness in the chest and it will become difficult to breathe. Next, please. So what can we use this for? In, the, in this project, we have looked at uh, nanoparticles. So we have already published that there is a strong correlation for zinc oxide between lung surfactant function inhibition and changes in breathing pattern uh, during inhalation. We are also preparing uh, a publication with uh, 20, more than 20 nanomaterials uh, that were tested in the Smart Nanotox project. We have also used the method for impregnation products, inhaled pharmaceuticals and exhibients, PFAS and cleaning spray products. Next, please. So this was uh, all that I had for today. And um, I think there is a poll now, right? Yes, there is. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, and again, we invite people to submit questions at any time. So that brings us to the end of our four main presentations that we have today. And obviously we've shared a lot of information with you through the presentations today, but we wanted to get an idea of how this might be useful um, or or what, what you would like to take this, how you'd like to uh, take this further. So now I'm going to try and launch my next poll. Um, oh, hang on. No, here we go. Polling two. So hopefully you can see on your screen now uh, the second poll, which gives you um, ask the question which outcomes you are interested in. So let me know if you can't see it, but hopefully you can. And I will launch the polling now uh, and then feel free to answer anything. And you can have multiple choice here. You can have more than one answer. So let's see what people would like to have. We have data is uh, surging into a strong lead here, but that's always really interesting out of these projects. And uh, that's quite a lot of the challenge out of them as well in getting the data into a sort of legal and 
cleanliness form that allows it to be shared that, in a way that is useful. So we have a few more votes coming in. So I will just give it a few seconds more as we have, I think we have most of the people have answered now, which is great. So I will now end the polling in a couple of moments and share the results. So in fact, we actually got quite an even mix. So obviously some of you may want the results from everything. So you can see the data is, data is the winner, but it always is. So hopefully um, what we will do after this webinar is Vladimir can share exactly the process of, that would enable you to gain access to the data from the project. Uh, so I think this is very helpful for us to know where your priorities lie. So I'm going to stop sharing the results now. Then I'm going to go to the final quick poll of today, which is how do you, how would you like to know more? Because one of the things of this project as well is to work out how it follows up with people after the project is closed. What would you see as useful next? And again, you can have more than one option here. So whether you're quite happy to read things through the publications, uh, whether you would like to definitely move ahead with accessing data, where, whether you would like more information or videos or publications that help explain what the project has done, whether you would like to receive training directly, and um, that can be either in face-to-face -face workshops or online. And then finally, more workshops, which are probably more interactive than training, where you can follow up from the project directly. And again, we have a really nice set of people who have responded. So I will now end the polling and give you the results. So you can see the results here. We've got the most popular things are access to the data. So Vladimir can definitely follow that up after the webinar with all of the registered delegates. Uh, training, which is really nice to see. And I think these days we're all quite used to online training now. And of course, more interactive workshops. So what I'm going to do now is throw Vladimir back into it and talk about how the outcomes of Smart Nanotox are being progressed in other projects or in other ways that will make access to them easy. So Vladimir, do you just want to share what the next steps are after Smart Nanotox is finished? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, I'm not going to uh, show the uh, slides here, but I would refer to the slides in my initial presentation, uh, or if you can open that again. So we have uh, basically uh, cataloged the, uh, where different outcomes go, and they, they are going to go in, in, in different directions. Some, for example, omics data are traditionally deposited in uh, geo database and they can be found. So for, uh, to find them easier th through the project, we'll uh, put uh, links from a Smart Nanotalks website uh, to those uh, data sets. Most of the data will be uh, say or organized and, and uh, uh, set for uh, sharing by Nano Commons. Nano Commons is another Horizon 2020 project, the data infrastructure project, which is now working with our data, trying to organize, make it uh, database searchable, uh, and uh, then it should be possible to um, access it. So some uh, data maybe will not be available immediately uh, after a certain embargo, but uh, certainly within a year, we'll, we'll have all the data available. Then, uh, in addition to that, in Nana Commons, we have uh, deposited uh, several uh, in silico tools, the uh, modeling tools, for example, corona prediction tools, and some QSTAR models will be deposited there as well. And that is free to use. If you register with the uh, Nano Commons uh, website and Nano Commons project, you can get uh, access to that. So you can use uh, the data for free. Uh, finally, you have seen uh, various other outcomes. Uh, we will also publish a list of exploitables that is going, uh, it's, we newly finished that, so it's going to be posted on the project website uh, where we list all the uh, tools and methods and protocols we've developed. So that is going to be 
uh, over uh, vitro cell products, but uh, other partners also have developed in vitro tools uh, that they're uh, ready to share or to, to sell if uh, you want to purchase uh, some of the devices and, and uh, like uh, Institute, Yorzev Stefan Institute in Ljubljana is, is one of uh, those uh, partners. And also we have in, in silico tools, some of them are free to use, um, freeware, open source, and, and some of them uh, will be included in commercial products that Mark uh, to, to, told you about. So that, that work, EQ Sarsen uh, Material Studio from Biovia. So th this is briefly an overview, but again, a uh, longer list uh, of uh, the outcomes and uh, the projects that they inherit the tools and develop them further are listed in my presentation in the project uh, legacy slide. That's great. And we'll share the slides with everybody after that registered for this webinar originally. And we have a question in which I'm going to pose to you, Vladimir. And it okay. says, how do you handle the variation of nanomaterial characteristics from one slide supplier to another? Uh, an example being carbon nanotubes, which are quite complicated materials to characterize and generally have a quite a wide intra-batch um, distribution in terms of diameter, length, curvature, etc. So what can be concluded from prediction or simulation uh, not, and without even considering their tendency to form bundles or aggregates? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now what we have uh, that, that is also can be found on the project website. We have a list of materials with the uh, about 30 uh, different carbon nanotubes with the variations made on purpose and, and in a well controlled, well controlled way. So there we can have already an idea of how the variation of like surface functionalization, uh, thickness or, or length or rigidity influences the characteristics. So we, we try to uh, kind of extracted from the data from well characterized materials. Okay, so that should be already uh, obvious from the models. But if we talk about, uh, as a new question, uh, if we talk about more realistic materials where we have intra batch variation, so that, that is yet to be implemented. So we, we didn't address this uh, at all in Smart Nanotop, but in the follow up uh, project in, in uh, and then a solvent, uh, for example, that is uh, running now. Uh, th this methods will be developed further. So we will look at material heterogeneity and we'll try to adapt the same models to uh, more uh, realistic uh, materials, like take into account uh, like surface heterogeneity or length heterogeneity uh, and uh, not only mean uh, size of, of the material, but the size distribution. So as of now, I, I don't know of any models actually including this. The only information we get is from different materials that we characterize uh, separately and, and then put in, into the same predictive model. Thanks very much, Vladimir. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of the webinar if there are no further questions. So I would like to thank all of our presenters for their hard work in preparing the uh, information that we shared with you today. And as I mentioned before, we will follow up by sharing the recording and the slides, plus contact details of Vladimir so that you can ask directly in terms of uh, follow up on some of your questions, particularly around the data access. So Vladimir, did you want to say anything else before I close the webinar? Sorry, I, I muted myself. <laughs> so the, the simplest uh, thing is to uh, just uh, go to the uh, project web page. It will be maintained even after the end of the project, and we will post project outcomes and links to the uh, products and a list of exploitables there. So if you're interested in any specific things, so we are available uh, for consultations, for for training, or for uh, discussions, further discussions. Uh, uh, about these methods or results. Okay, that, so I would, would say the, the best way to contact us, yes, through the project website and addresses given there. Super. 
Okay, that's super. So I'm going to say thank you very much to everybody that attended today and thank you again to our presenters. You are now free to go and get your afternoon or morning coffee compared to depending on where you are. And we look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.